Kia ora, talofa, namaste, haere mai, and welcome to this week's episode of The Niche Cast. We are from the niche cash, the niche-cash.com, where we deliver major, big, hefty, hearty Aotearoa sporting content in honour of Aotearoa. We love Aotearoa, and we love Aotearoa sport, and that's what we're here to do every day. Well, just to swing a leg, swing an arm, a little bit of a yoga pose to get the blood moving. There was a, we were talking about Avondale Bowling Club in the um, Variety Show Musical Jam segment. And then Tom Scott uploaded a uh, interview thingy-majig little cooking show with uh, Troy Kingy. So I'm not sure if you've seen that or if, you're, if you haven't seen it, I'd recommend it to you. Yeah, I, I saw that you'd shared it um, and I hadn't had a a chance to have a peek at it yet so I, I did i did sort of like leave that one open let's return to this tab later on and see how it goes so i look forward to that how many tabs you got open right now uh well because we're recording i've shut my brave window i only have the chrome window open so probably about six or seven and otherwise it would be you're on a 20 diet. odd i would say probably <laughs> Um, yeah, so oh, it's just like, my my computer CPU is on a diet. <laughs> Can't feed too much junk food before podcast recording. It's on uh, intermittent fasting. No breakfast this morning, just uh, steaming ahead. The reason I like, obviously, yeah. we we enjoy yeah. a bit of Troy Kingy and we enjoy a bit of Avondale Bowling Club as well. Probably elite Aotearoa music. Like if we're dealing in elite Aotearoa athletes and sporting figures. You know, the Stephen Adams, the Chris Wood, the Kane Williamson, the uh, James Fisher Harris type of characters. Tom Scott, Troy Kingy, the Beths, Aldous Harding, Williams, Marlon Williams. Album. So it's good to see. What are your, how do you feel about that? Just two uh, major forces of Aotearoa music Tom Scott, Troy Kingy. Um, you, you haven't watched the interview, but as far as like musical, connection goes any thoughts that come to mind there well i saw it said that they're almost exactly the same age or something yeah, along those I think lines. It was, like they in the were description born, they were born like a day apart or something yeah same year a day apart apparently troy king is from the bay of islands and then obviously tom scott from uh evandale so yeah troy king he lives in uh kiri kiri from what i understand hmm. I went and watched a concert of his with Delaney Davison a couple, like a year or two ago when he was, when he was, you know, touring on the last album and the front row was all like people that look like him and people that clearly knew him because they were talking about him just as Troy and stuff before the thing started. Like, it's obviously just his whole family you know, got all the front roads, got all the good seats as you would. Like, it's a homecoming show. That's how you do it. I wonder if Troy Kingy is related to Kaisen Kingy, who I mentioned as part of the Penrith Panthers Kiwi NRL breakdown. Mm. Kaisen Kingy is also from Kiri Kiri. Um, so I'm curious. Maybe there's a, uh, a little Fano link there. Big up to the Patreon Fano, patreon.com forward slash E L Niche Cash. Our Niche Cash is the best way to support the Niche Cash and all of our content every week. We deliver an extra podcast to the Patreon Fano and try and encourage a bit of bit of corridor on the patreon page because we're more likely to respond to patreon folks than uh, the random facebook comments or uh, whatever else so big up to the patreon Fano. thank you very much for your support and if you are generous enough to want to support the niche cache and our content directly join the patreon Fano, patreon.com forward slash our niche cache el niche cache and tomorrow's friday which means our email newsletter dispatch will be sent out Friday evening featuring all sorts of uh, Aotearoa sporting content, all the links to the website, all the links to the podcast, as well as extra, yeah, extra paragraphs, extra, I'm not sure what you'd call like a, is it a digit, like a single thing on the screen, extra digits, coming at you about Aotearoa sport. We cover everything, a little bit of everything except for the old rugby union. So if you do love Aotearoa sport and you do want a uh, Aotearoa sporting musings sent straight to, to you on a Monday and Friday evening, sign up to our email newsletter via Substack, the niche case .substack .com. 
Wildcard, we start our podcast with a dose of mindfulness. What do you have today? Yeah, I got, um, I'm not sure if I've used this book before, but um, Shinru Suzuki's Zen Mind Beginner's Mind is a relatively recent pickup. Um, and fella says in a random page where I flicked through and found a quote that sounded good enough to use. Um, and this is a good one too. It says, when you become you, Zen becomes Zen. When you are you, you see things as they are and you become one with your surroundings. When you are you, Zen becomes Zen. I do feel like the Zen path is exactly that. Like if you if you embark on the Zen path or the mindfulness path, you are literally just trying to connect with yourself and your soul. And that's the journey is like, it's not easy. It's not hard. There's actually another mindfulness I've heard where um, depression is just a mutiny of the soul. So your soul is mm. staging a mutiny and that, is manifested as depression and that just makes depression all good like if you're depressed you it's all good like you just need to pay listen because that's your soul telling you whatever the fuck you're doing right now is wrong to your soul's perspective and that is the mutiny of your soul because your soul wants to connect with its uh own divine energy and i think for a lot of people that is the journey of mindfulness and the journey of zen and journey of some of these ideas is just becoming yourself and to become yourself you need to listen to your soul and then it's like that part of that cycle where you need to connect with your soul understand that maybe your soul is unhappy staging a mutiny and then you embark on the path and you just become your true self yeah i do think that's often the case with a lot of mental illness like not just depression but anxiety and and things like this like it's uh, i mean obviously not all the time but i do think obviously uh, like often it is a case of um you know there's like certain fundamental things that your soul requires um in order to feel fulfilled and content and you know things like um community like relationships with other people feeling a part of something bigger than yourself a lot of a lot of anxiety and depression comes from a feeling of isolation. Um, I also think just one thing that's really, I don't know, limited in today's society is just a creative output or outlet rather, where, I mean, for a lot of the people we're going to be talking about on this podcast today, their creative output or outlet is their sport. But then you also get times where if that suddenly doesn't feel the case, then you will lose passion for that sport. Um, and you need other things like it's, it's and just the way that society works these days it's like you need something you just go to the shop and get it and most of the time the thing that you need to go and get was like produced in a factory or something by a, by a machine you don't have the same like can you imagine in the old days where it's like if your shirt rips you have to stitch it up yourself you know just simple things like that um or you can't go down to the grocery store and get fridge fresh vegetables because we're not at an age yet where refrigeration allows you to keep vegetables fresh for long enough for like a shipping process to occur. So you got to grow them yourself if you want that. Like that's a creative outlet, output too, or outlet. Um, things like that, where it's like a lot of that's been stripped away. And I think that is, that is something that a lot of people, I don't know, struggle with. It's definitely something that I like look for ways to be creative in my own life, just to like stave off that kind of thing. But not just to stave off, but also because it gives you the opposite effect. When you do it, you feel better. You feel worse when you don't do it. You don't. You don't just get back to even, um, back to zero when you do. It's like you go above that, um, which in a way is kind of the opposite of that. You be you, Zen be Zen. Like it's a different idea, but just yeah, on you, that, you like went down a uh, whole different path. There. Like you, <laughs> I, I did. Um, but the dog also, a, also a valuable path. But just the you be you, Zen becomes Zen thing. The one thing I wanted to add to that is just like a lot of the times with. I don't know. Um, when you're trying to accomplish anything, it sort of is presented as like the hero's journey type thing where you might end up where you started, but you you are changed in some way. Like you've got to go on this quest. You've got to add these like skills, upskill constantly um, and just continually improve with all these little accomplishments in order to achieve the end goal. With Zen mindset, it sort of feels like the opposite. You you don't want to add things on. You don't you're not trying to like add skill sets, you know, feathers in your cap and strings to your bow or whatever. You actually kind of want to strip all that away 
and just get back to like the core essence which seems to be the point and you just you be you that's what that is isn't it it's like be the natural self that you were born to be like don't fight against that and try to be something else that others are telling you to be or or that you feel yourself that you should be like just roll play the hand you're given you know like roll roll with it um and then you'll find it a lot easier to be at one with nature when you are at one with your own nature to begin with because obviously if you're not that it's going to be pretty hard to be at one with all nature but if you're at one with your own nature you realize your own nature is kind of the same as all nature and suddenly there's nothing else to i guess that's also an othering thing isn't it when like when people bring themselves separate to to nature and that causes issues but that's a uh, one tangent's enough for this mindfulness I yeah i think we need to stick mindfulness needs to be about one idea and we literally just uh, well hey you, you you threw the second one out there i'm just saying i would suggest it was a good the, one though. I, I would suggest the hero's journey is exactly the process you laid out there's no difference between the hero's journey and a zen journey the hero's mm -hmm. journey takes you on the journey to strip everything away that's the whole yeah, point of it. Because you do, journey. you do in those cycles, you do end up back where you started. Precisely. You sort of realize, well, oh, I had the power all along, kind of thing. <laughs> oh, Ted, I was sporting matters may commence right now. There is the Rugby League World Cup popping up on the radar wildcard. And I would like to uh, say that these are absolutely bonkers sporting times. So much shit is happening. I concur. Um, <laughs> But organization that's why this uh maybe maybe the mindfulness is just to stick to one idea at a time because we've got 50 million sporting ideas running through our heads at the moment and we're uh, fizzed up to do the podcast so we do love to spin a yarn but it's also very chaotic times for the Aotearoa sporting beat uh one of those things is the rugby league world cup obviously we've got blokes and wahine uh world cups going on and the kiwis have named a team to play against Leeds, which is a pretty cool concept where not all the Kiwis players are going to play, uh, but Thomas Luloi, one of Papatoi's finest, he uh, is named a halfback for a like a swan song appearance for the Kiwis, um, and they will play Leeds. There's a couple different wrinkles to some of the rugby league stuff that I've been pondering wildcard where every every like world cup or kiwis international thing it's just there's a bunch of randoms who want to play for aotearoa and i've seen this like like sebastian chris he's basically saying he doesn't want to play origin because he's born and raised in queensland i believe yeah sure and there's a there's this other thing where like here i go myself offering 50 million ideas based off the one idea um there is this thing where like uh if you are moldy you're a kiwi i think there's a lot of moldies in australia who are born and raised in australia and they can represent aotearoa rugby league through the moldy all-stars so that makes us it it's an interesting one with someone like chris because he's born and raised in australia there is that moldy all-stars representative route to like connect you with your uh whanau. but he wants to play for the kiwis which I think is fantastic. And then the Kiwi Ferns, you got some players who have like one player uh, has represented the Australian PMs 13. Another one's played Queensland under 19s this year. And then the other one's played for um, Australia, like rugby. And I think if you combine Racine McGregor, Paige McGregor, and then might have been Shanice Parker, they've all played rugby union for Australia. Or like sevens rugby for australia now they're playing for the kiwi friend it's just it's quite interesting because everyone wants to throw out these names but at the end of the day we have no idea who actually wants to represent aotearoa and who doesn't it's a very weird one um but yeah the, how any ideas based off that just the um the different players popping up all over the show to represent aotearoa or you've got players born and raised in new zealand and just because they're born in new zealand like someone like spencer Lenu born in new zealand but basically was raised in australia but you see a lot of people saying you know born in new zealand then you're a kiwi well a lot of these especially polynesians and maldives like 
they're born in New Zealand, but everything about their life is Australian. But they're Samoan Tongan. So it's uh, it's just been interesting to watch some of that wash up with uh, how people view these players. What is a Kiwi? You know, who who wants to play for Aotearoa Kiwis? Who doesn't want to play for Aotearoa Kiwis? Because you've had like Murray Taulangi, Cowboys winger, born and raised in Auckland, played, you know, left Auckland 12, 13 years old. Now he's playing for Australia. It's a very strange uh, situation, but all of that is to say that you can only really judge it on what the player's actions are as opposed to, oh, this player's going to do this, this player's going to do that. No, every player has their own vibe. Yeah, it kind of ultimately, because there's such close connections between the Anzac countries in general. Like, it's just, there's a lot of immigration both ways. There's a lot of, um, you know just shared cultural type things it's not a big shift if you go and live in australia it's compared to living in you know Aotearoa, it's not a it's not a crazy difference um so like moving to i don't know um for some reason i'm thinking of uh, stefan marinovich living in israel these days or having played in germany or you know countries like that's it's, it's not that big of a shift and so just you get lots of I don't know. You just get a lot of players in a lot of sports who are eligible for both. And they might have strong connection. Like, despite, I don't know, um, a lifetime of propaganda about, like, Farlap and Pavlova and Finn Brothers and Russell Crowe and things like that. Who owns who? It's like, well, actually, well, a most lot of, of the younger things... generation have no idea what those things are. <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> yeah, well, there's that for starters. We barely um, have any, like, clue what those things are. And also, Farlap's a horse. Like, yeah, I don't think fucking, horses like, have citizenship. Like, <laughs> probably longer than that. Like, when's the last time a horse had to have, had to get like a passport or something? I'm sure there's some kind of like um, customs things you got to go through. But I'm pretty sure a horse going through customs would be more like you know a parcel going through like, a baggage. You know, I don't think it's treated like a human. Um, so that's weird to begin with. But just it's not like the it's not a people can have links to both countries and be completely emotionally invested in both sides in which case it's just like which do you prefer and for some people it's like i'm not going to make the origin squad so i'll try and i if i don't make origin i won't play for australia so we could play for new zealand because it's a better a career opportunity for other people it's an emotional thing and it's based on you know the family and um and deeper connections and maybe childhood um, aspects and whatever. There's no right or wrong. And even just like in the football scene, recent times, there's been a lot of this, like just the stuff I've been covering. You think of Gianni Stenson has moved to the Phoenix because he had a Kiwi parent um, committed to New Zealand, played under twenties, then got quite good. <laughs> it committed back to Australia, which is where he felt at home. But like he moved for a career opportunity, went back for an emotional thing. You look at like Ali Green and India Page Riley with different situations in terms of child, like Ali Green, grew up entirely in Australia, but as a Kiwi mother, um, Indy Riley moved to Australia as a teenager, um, sort of 12, 13 age, but has completely Kiwi family. Still, most of them live in Auckland kind of thing. Um, both switched back to, um, to play for the football phones recently, like within the last year. And even just like, cause you know, the Wellington Phoenix Wahine team have this trick thing with, you got to have at least five Australians in the thing. Well, one of the Australians they've registered, this year is Michaela Robertson, who's um, born and bred Wellingtonian, one Australian parent. Therefore, she got an Australian passport to play for the Phoenix, and now she's playing as an Australian player. Completely like she's been, she hasn't played for the Football Ferns, but she's been called up to squads before. I think she was in the wider Olympic squad um, relatively recently, like gaming the system a little bit. But also, of course, you're going to do that if you're the Wellington Phoenix. But just the point being, like, there's a lot of reasons why players would go back and forth. And ultimately, it's just like, if you have the choice, you just make it. Best, right? Which, sometimes it's a career thing. Sometimes it's an emotional thing. Sometimes it's just like, I want to play with the lads, you know? <laughs> like, um, someone like, who'd you say, Sebastian Chris, like playing Moldy All-Stars. I would imagine there would be a lot of proud, like, Kiwi representatives in that team. Not everyone has to be like, Kalen Ponga played that, didn't he? Um it's situations like that, although Kalen Ponga does say he wants to play for the All Blacks, who plays Union, but that's a that's a whole other can of worms. Um, 
but also probably had a couple other guys in his ear being like, well, you know, World Cup, end of the year, what do you reckon? Sort of thing. Like, there might just be something like that. Because I think that's what we've seen with the Samoa squad recently is just like all those Panthers dudes are playing for Samoa. It's like, uh, you know, they're copping a lot of flack at the moment, um, the Panthers, for, for some of their celebration things. I kind of love it. I, I love the friskiness and the um, and the whatever, a bit of, bit of rivalry and whatnot. But those guys clearly love playing with each other. And a lot of them are going to go and play at the World Cup with each other. You know, it's just continuation of that kind of thing. It's just like, let's play with the lads. Um, there's lots of reasons why players go back and forth. And it's just one of those, like, play it as it lays. As, as a fan, sit, like, at a distance from that, just, you know, take it as it comes. Some players will commit. Some players won't commit. You're going to have ones that get away. And you're also going to get some ones that you scoop up that you never expected. So you just kind of got to see who turns up on the day when squads are named, you know? For all that Panthers, Samoan, I don't know what the Samoan equivalent of mana is, but for all of that, Moses Liotta is playing for Aotearoa. True. So it's like, there's no rhyme or reason with any of this shit. I actually thought the Māori All-Stars would um, take some players away from Aotearoa Kiwis because that is their route to connect with mm. their Māori heritage. Like, Kalen Ponga never has to represent Aotearoa to represent his like moldy lineage on a footy field because he can play moldy all-stars every single year so it's I, I actually thought that was going to happen but it's uh seems to be a bit of both whereas the woman right now it seems like you can play origin and kiwis kiwi ferns which uh, it's a bit of a weird situation in the women's rugby league because it's like players are pulling out because they have to work yeah so I saw it's that. A, yeah, like we're very far off from any semblance of equality there. But I'm um, just swinging back to the Kiwis team to play Leeds. So this is happening this weekend. This game will be streamed on YouTube, so you can watch it on YouTube. I think it's Sunday morning, and then the rest of the games are on Spark. Or I think they're delayed on three, which is cool. Um, all the Eels and Panthers players aren't playing, so it's just the rest of the squad getting a bit of a run around. Uh, Sean's little clock stands at fullback, which is good for him. Um, but all of this is to set up the World Cup wildcard, where I've been thinking, like, the winner of this World Cup might not be the most talented team. In these situations, I think, it, you know, having a group like this, because everyone's fantasizing about what a strongest possible Kiwis team is, or what a strongest possible, like, Samoan team or Tongan team. If you're rolling through a tournament, someone's going to get injured. Someone's definitely going to get suspended. Someone's going to get concussed. And we're not doing so in none of the uh, tour Tonga Vailoa concussion no. <laughs> yeah, uh, medical practices here. Like if you're concussed, you're going to be out. And all of that shit's going to happen in a tournament, as well as the fact that this tournament, the World Cup, is starting like two weeks after the grand final. So a bunch of players are right like that's why the panthers and eels aren't in england right yet like for the players for aotearoa they might still be in sydney and then flying over you know in the next couple of days so you can do all the fantasizing you want about possible teams and different combinations and we're going to have you know uh britain nakora plays on the right edge for the sharks is he going to play left edge or right edge for the kiwis like all that shit's going to be happening but the team who wins the most games, they're going to have the most best depth because players are going to get injured. Players are going to be missing. Um, let alone performance. Like for some reason, this just sticks in my head. Like respect to the Samoans, respect to the Usos. While Tonga was rising up as a as a force in rugby league. Samoa Rugby Union and Samoa Rugby League had dramas at multiple World Cups. Like uh, coaching staff taking money, uh, players returning from a World Cup overweight because all they did was kick back and eat. Like for whatever reason, that drama has followed Samoa. And yes, Tonga's had drama. Like there's definitely been drama with Tonga after their after the 2017 world cup like as we know politicians and officials are a bit greedy and they keep a lot of the money to themselves and 
all the, all, some of the stuff the Tongan players were talking about didn't actually eventuate. But for some reason, in rugby league and rugby union, those dramas have happened for Samoa in two different, at least two different World Cups. And that's just kind of a situation where it's like, yeah, you like so much shit goes into a major tournament like this, where it's never about who has the best players. Because you can go back to the last World Cup, Australia, they always have the best players. Like they have the best player, Cameron Smith, a second best player, Billy Slater. Like that's how the Australian team works. And yet the grand final against England was super niggly. It was like less than 10 points were scored or some, something crazy like that. And it, all, it just all gets chucked into this pot where this is a World Cup. The most talented team might not win and the team who does win is going to have various options in every position they're going to absorb uh, wins and losses and availability the best and they're going to come together and build towards a common goal which is these are all reasons for encouragement and optim optimism for the for the kiwis because they've been building for a long time now and michael mcguire keeps mentioning like 2019 and that was when Chance Nickel Clocks that was selected at center. And Michael Maguire literally like groomed him to play center because he was playing fullback for the Raiders. World Cup nines, he's playing center, even though it's nines, he's playing in the same position. And then he's starting center for those end of year tests in 2019. And it feels like Michael Maguire has been building this group together for a long time. You look at the Australian squad, they haven't been building anything because they weren't doing anything. Like at least Aotearoa's had a game against Tonga and like some of those combinations have been further established. And I wrote this in my like uh, squad yarn. That's why Isaac Liu selected. That's why Watane Zelezniak selected. That's why Nickel Klockstad selected. That's why Jesse Bromwich is going to play a lot. Like, forget about form. It's about the players that Michael Maguire is building with and, and what he wants to do. So... Fascinated by this World Cup, I definitely believe that reasons for excitement around the Aotearoa Kiwis, everyone's saying the talent, right? Like everyone's saying Joey Manu, the forward pack, Brandon Smith, Dylan Brown, Jerome Hughes, like everyone's pointing to the talent. Whereas my excitement for Aotearoa Kiwis, as I've said in the variety show, if you compare it to 2017, this is a team that's actually like building together they're actually moving forward together they've created an environment that players want to be a part of um, and that is the most exciting thing about the Aotearoa Kiwis heading into this World Cup which when combined with good talent is pretty exciting yeah I I mean because you're talking about all the different um the the ways in which you have to challenge your depth at these kind of tournaments because you absolutely do like it's the other thing is there's games in relatively short space of time so especially the the early games you're going to want to rotate some things anyway to keep guys fresh for later on and you're going to have to be able to win those games when you if you like rest so and so um you rest your starting front row as you someone's got to come in and do the same job hopefully against a weaker team like you target the fixtures kind of thing but um you're still going to be able to do the job you know and one big factor in that specifically is Joey Manu, who you mentioned there, who's of course coming back from an injury that, that to the end of the season for the Roosters, like should be good to go by the time it matters. But like it takes one setback for that to, to and then suddenly he's out for the tournament kind of thing. Like that can happen pretty like that, that can just happen full stop. Even if he wasn't coming back from injury, that could just happen. Um, he's had a couple untimely sort of like, missing um finals games in the last couple of years with just you know getting injured at the wrong time so the world cup's kind of the same thing so i mean like i do i don't know when, when, the, when squads are picked it becomes less of a thing like everyone's just got this this squad that they've picked to work with um australia have enough depth that they didn't see the need to pick the current Delhi m champion um and did dylan edwards win the when the Clive Churchill in the grand final, I didn't watch the presentation afterwards, but he's not in the squad. So if he did, he didn't. Um, that's pretty, like, you've obviously got a fair bit of depth if you can go through that, uh, those kind of decisions. But 
I mean, you, you've got the squad that you've picked. It's over in England, so it's hard to swap guys out if people get injured before then. I don't even know what the regulations about doing that is. So it's not like everyone has a crazy amount of players now to pick. It doesn't matter that Australia could pick 100 players who are good enough to pick, play at this level. Um, that doesn't matter. You've only got the squad that you take over. But all, I don't know, 26 or whatever the squad um, thing was, everyone there is going to have to do something valuable throughout the course of the tournament. I Do you, do you see that with the Kiwis where it's like the, the full squad can handle if someone like Joey Manu goes down? Because what we're talking about here is, is not just like, you're like, you know, role player for role player. Saying, like if a star player goes down, do they have an, because if I don't know, if, I don't know. Cameron Munster gets injured for um, for Australia. Ben Hunt can easily slide into the halves or something like that. Like they've got that kind of cover. I'm thinking specifically because um, the All Whites obviously missed Sapreet Singh in recent times. Like the Costa Rica game, the Australia games didn't have a guy who could unpick a defense. Made a difference because young emerging team and we've talked a lot about some of these other things about like having to rely on inexperienced players to be like the the, the role player type things that's always a factor but also they you take out one of their top five players and they did not have anyone who could do that same job is that something you see with the kiwis like do, do they have the guys to where if a star player goes down no dramas next man up kind of thing like it's a bit of a drama for sure but you, yeah you can <laughs> some some like, dramas but next man up some dramas next man up like so shan's nickel crocs there's starting at fullback for this game because there's no Joey Manu. Mm. Nickel Klockstad is not Joey Manu. Nickel Klockstad could barely crack the Raiders' top 17, right, at center or fullback for much of the season. But you put him in at fullback, it's okay. And I think what comes to mind is some of the Queensland origin selections. Like, people have, like, thrown up all these forward pack combinations without Jesse Bromwich or Wadaya Hargreaves. And that reminds me of Queensland when it was, like, we're just going to keep selecting Nate Miles because Nate Miles does the fucking job at the hardest level of the sport. And I think that is another element of the Kiwi selecting selection. Like Michael Maguire is sticking with blokes. He know he could, that can do a job. But if you roll through some of the positions, like, okay, Peter Hickey and Sebastian Chris are starting centers for this game against Leeds. One of them is injured, unavailable. You can put Marata near Corey at center. Okay, uh, first choice halves combination, Dylan Brown, Jerome Hughes. They're not going to play every game together. Kieran Foran's going to play a few games. And like this is the funniest thing. Like All the headlines in New Zealand are about Sean Johnson, and he's like the fourth, maybe fifth tier half from Aotearoa. There's no way he should be in the World Cup squad. Kieran Foran is way better than Sean Johnson right now. And that's the depth. Like, yeah, Dylan Brown and Jerome Hughes are fantastic, but pff, give me a bit of Kieran Foran. Like, he knows what to do at test level. He's played a lot of test footy. Uh, the forward pack kind of speaks for itself. Like, I love Kenny Bromwich and Isaiah Papali. One of them's out. Britton Nakor is playing. Easy. Like, yeah, sure, Jesse Bromwich doesn't need to play every game. When he's not playing, you just roll through the middle forward depth, and there's a lot of middle forward depth there. The one area would be dummy half, where you got Brandon Smith st starting. He's not going to start every game. I can f like none of these players are going to start every game. I'm fairly confident about that because you're playing some weak nations. There's no point starting. And everything we're saying again with the schedule, the the traveling rigors, and um, all of that stuff. No one's going to start every game. I don't think, but it's. Like Jeremy Marshall King, I don't even think he needs to sit on the bench. Like, you might carry Kieran Foran on the bench to cover halves and hooker if Brandon Smith gets injured mid game. Because, like, Brandon Smith is, <laughs> he plays so hard that he, it's a high chance he might get injured. Um, but you only need, like, two hookers. Because Jeremy Marsh in a top strength team, Jeremy Marshall's not in the team. You just you might have Kieran Foran there, or you might just not give a fuck and just like um at a pinch you might put Kenny Bromwich into hooker and bring on Nakora to the edge and work through some of those combinations, but 
that is the one area but like again you only need it's not like you need four hookers in a world cup squad like you don't need four to five halves in a world cup squad that's why sean johnson's not there you only need a couple and sure you need to cover your bases but that's why having marata near corey playing literally every fucking position is valuable um nickel clocks that that's valuable as well isaac liu can play middle and edge you got a bunch of forwards who can play middle and edge as well so that's part of the optimism is that the kiwis are well covered for a lot of these situations and circumstances that might appear and if you think like what was tonga's bigger biggest weakness in the mid-season test talatau amone was kicking from his 40 meter line every uh set and the ball just went to joey manu every set and it's like okay what happens if talatau amone gets injured who's playing in the halves then it's isaiah katoa and katoni stags isn't playing at this world cup i don't think but like jason tamalolo's in the halves or whatever you know like samoa same he thing. might be able to do it you know <clears throat> oh he can do it he can fucking do everything samoa same thing what happens if uh, there's an injury in the halves suddenly you're going from jerome Lua and chanel harris tavita down to another player and i think the kiwis are well poised for some of those situations that the world cup will definitely throw up well looking at the draw it's um i mean it's it's not too grueling because it's not like one of those things i wondered if like they'd have to play all three group stage games in the space of like a week and a half or two weeks or something like that it's not it's like there's a game every week for five weeks basically um or six i guess if you make because the, there's yeah like the group stage is four teams we've got lebanon jamaica and ireland so there's no excuses for not finishing first in that group but it also does kind of mean like um oh how would you it's it's, it's kind of like playing. a soft introduction yeah everyone's going to get games everyone's and if playing. joey manu's not ready for game one no dramas if he's not ready for game two no dramas he's not ready for game three there's a little bit of a drama because you kind of wanted to have at least one tune-up but um the they should finish first in their group and they go it's like big very important to finish first so you play a second place team from one of the other groups the first knockout game quarterfinals is until the 4th of november so that's you know this that's a nice kind of introduction there and then it's like you know quarterfinal one week a week later semi-final a week later final um three three potentially tough games in a row once you get to the knockouts the group stage shouldn't be quite so grueling um as you say everyone's going to get a game in that situation and you can probably you know if you needed to try out some of those contingency plans you could like you could you could try an extra half or something like that even if it's just like 30 minutes at the end of a game um you could figure out what your backup plan kind of thing is in those cases it's yeah, it, it's it's a good one, but it's, it's one of those World Cups which is going to be like soft, 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 and then very difficult all of a sudden. Like once you hit the knockouts, that's the real deal. Let's roll through some of these other topics. Wildcard we'll, might have to um, seek a bit of Shoshin growth improvement mindset and really challenge ourselves to stick with one idea at a time um, or else we'll waffle on too much here. But we do have sneaky Black Caps cricket. They are playing a very random tri-series T20 series against Pakistan and Bangladesh. Obviously, Bangladesh and Pakistan will play each other as well. All games in Christchurch, warm-ups for the T20 World Cup. As far as ranking this in the pantheon of October, Aotearoa Sporting Matters, it's not very high on the agenda because we are building to a T20 World Cup, um, but it is happening. What are you... Like, what's one or two things, Wildcard, that you are looking for in this tri-series? Well, the first one is, you said it's happening. This is the, the first thing I'm looking for is whether it actually does happen. Because weather across the country not been great recently. And I think they're playing in Christchurch. And I did see a picture of the pitch. Um, and it, I'm not sure, I couldn't tell because it was a grainy thing. But it was either the... It's either that thing where you've got covers across the entire field, including all the outfield, 
or it was flooded. I'm not sure I which. I believe it has um, uh, been snowing in Christchurch. It's been snowing in Wellington, apparently, um, a little bit recently. So if Wellington's getting some, then uh, Watch out, Christchurch is probably, yeah, <laughs> well, it's working its way up. Um, I had to explain to an Englishman at football once that it doesn't snow here. <laughs> like we're cold before training sort of thing, shivering. He's like, oh, it feels like it's going to snow. And I'm like, have you ever seen snow here? How long have you lived here? Seven years? It's like, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't snow this. I lived in Auckland for 25 years and it never snowed. So I don't think it's going to snow in Whangarei. But if it ever does, it'll be now. Um, and it certainly is not going to be nice. For us. <laughs> um, of all the countries in the world to have to play the first game of this tri-series in whether it's snowing or not, whether it's raining or not, it's going to be freezing in, in Christchurch. Bangladesh and Pakistan are maybe the two least suited to be able to do that. Like of all, of all the countries, that's going to be tough for them. Um, my respects to those uh, brave soldiers, you know. Um, <laughs> I also noticed that there's a fantastic new sponsor for a uh, Black Cap series that they're hosting and and the sponsor is an overseas one. It's um, Bangla Wash, which is I imagine it's a Bangladesh. I think a Bangladeshi detergent or so. Yeah, yeah, it is. But also, that's going to lead to some nice. Um, it's going to need to some lead to some nice high headlines of Bangladesh struggle and you know, lose all their games, and then you got the Bangla Wash series. It's so those are they're nothing to do with black caps or setting things yeah. towards the twenty twenty World Cup. But maybe that's also a point, which is that. Unlike previous World Cups, I actually think they know what their best 11 is going into this tournament. I don't really know that there's anything to learn other than just getting some guys some reps because it's been a, a month or two since they played 2020 cricket, which would have been in the West Indies. Played, what, two ODI series since then and some guys probably had a little bit of a break. Get the reps in. That's important. Other than that, I kind of don't think there's anything to learn. I mean, the one thing maybe is like, is Finell in first 11 opening um or is devon conway going to be opening and it's the same thing as the kiwis that it's a world at a world cup there might be opportunities for both to happen and certainly in a warm-up game if you're trying to figure that out here's your opportunity but i suspect finn allen is probably the backup better and they will prefer to have the bowling options in a wicket keeper opening it just gives you a bit more freedom um in which case I think whichever way they go, they probably already know which way they're going. So there's not there's not really anything to learn from this series at all, other than maybe scouting out Bangladesh and Pakistan, who I assume we don't play at the World Cup. We'd have to check what the draw is, or else I don't know if we'd be playing them right now. But Pakistan are legitimately one of the two or three very best um, 2020 teams in the world, and even in Australia, will be competing for that title. Um, for, Maybe even especially in Australia, I actually think when you've got a decent pace bowling attack, that's something that might help them out as a subcontinent team rather than the usual of hindering them. Um, and they have the best opening partnership in the world beyond any doubts with uh, Rizman and um, Baba. Those two are just absolutely fantastic. And if you don't take an early wicket against them, you're in big trouble. Um so yeah, who gives a just, shit? This is nothing for the. This is really nothing to say about the Black Caps, though. Is the thing I really don't know what's is, what there what there is to gain other than just the usual. It's warm up games. Get your reps in. Finellan feels a bit like uh, Griffin Niami, Jordan Ricky, Matthew Tomoko, where they're like certified quality athletes and they're going to play for Aotearoa for a long time, um, but there is a pecking order and yeah. There's this, like, you got to be better than the bloke ahead of you. So um, you'll definitely see him bat. You'll definitely see a bunch of combinations. You'll definitely see, um, I don't know what you'll see. I don't know what I'll see because I <laughs> don't know if I'll watch much of it. Rain, but, maybe. Um, yeah, you might, see, you might see cricket played in snow in New Zealand, which would be uh, pretty fun. The White Ferns are also playing at the moment. They just won their T20 series against West Indies uh, this morning, but they got another game tomorrow. So um, plug that for the email tomorrow. We'll throw out some uh, review stats there, which is good for them. But it's in this series. This series also wildcard will overlap, I think, with the start of the Plunkett Shield. And to put in perspective, like my picking order, 
Plunkett Shield is ahead of this random T20 tri-series, right? So that kind of tells you where my cricketing priorities lie right now. Um, hearty cricket fans were obviously being tuned in, but you're going to see a lot of, like, you're going to see Black Caps play Pakistan a few times, Bangladesh versus Pakistan a few times, Bangladesh versus the Black Caps a few times. Not sure you're going to see massive crowds. Like it's a bit of a weird series, but it is a warm-up series. Happy days. This morning, Wildcard, you were watching Marco Staminich in the Champions League. Any updated thoughts about Aotearoa's uh, not the greatest Champions League export, but someone who's uh, rising up those ranks? What did you think about his latest performance? Well, the fellow on the BT Sport commentary... Um... I think it was the Summerby dude. I can't remember. He was Robbie Savage was his co-commentator, which is always a strange experience listening to the Robbie Savage gushing you know, to a microphone. Um, didn't hear him say anything about Staminich in particular, though. So unfortunate there. Um, did manage to shout at his son, who plays for Manchester United's reserve team, though. So <laughs> he had his priorities in order. Um, but the main commentator at one point talked about Staminich. He obviously had like the the nugget ready to go sort of thing. You hear that. When you hear a commentator just roll out a stat and it's like, oh, he prepared this. <laughs> yeah, he's got this in his notebook. He was waiting for an opportunity to use this. Um, and he talked about, you know, Winston Roof got a shout out. He mentioned that Danny Hay apparently says that Staminich has the ability to be one of New Zealand's best ever players, which sure, yeah, he does. Um, I guess that's news if you're an Englishman. But he also said that only three New Zealanders have played Champions League before, which is incorrect. Um, obviously didn't get his sources from the niche cash because I would tell you there's... Um, uh, what are we? Five, I believe. Um, Kim Wright, Winston Rufa, Danny Hay, Chris Killen, and Marco Staminich. So Staminich, with his second appearance, goes ahead of Danny Hay, who only made one. He goes level with Kim Wright, who had two. I think Chris Killen had about five, and, and Winston Rufa played, uh, I think, ten games. He had a full season. Tied the golden boot with Ronald Koeman. That's worth adding every single time that Winston Rufa comes up, because that's an unparalleled achievement. Um, what about the footy? Staminich... Stamina Cheddar's, you know, they were playing Manchester City. <laughs> to, to put that out there, they're playing Manchester City, might be the best club team in the world right now. Either way, they're in incredible form, probably favorites for this Champions League. He got to meet Erling Haaland, got to watch Erling Haaland score two goals with, I mean, his first goal was with his first touch. That's just the crazy thing about Haaland is he, he barely touches the ball and yet he's the biggest presence on the field. It's so it's so buzzy to watch that because you like you know the defense is completely focused on everything he's doing, but he doesn't do that much. He's just he's so economical with how he uh, he just he's a pure striker who knows like when do I make the late run? This is where I do it. Drop off, find the pockets of space, anticipate where the ball's going to go, and then he's also just like the biggest dude out there, like a striker who can bully defenders, and so he wins every header and holds up every ball. He's he's nuts. Um, Respectfully, Wildcard, I only care about Marco Siofatu Staminich. You've, you've done. So you've got the research nugget there going as well with the middle name. Um, I want to know how he's playing footy. Tell me his play, how he's playing footy. He, on on. Well, their captain did his ACL on the weekend. Who's their defensive midfielder? He's out for the whole season. Their other midfielder who he started with alongside Staminich um, went off injured in the first half. So Staminich, weirdly, was like the main man in midfield um, against a team that had 75% of possession. So you didn't actually see a whole lot of him. Like, but you watch him, you're just seeing him like making quick movements, close down a guy, but not too close because he'll dribble past you because it's Man City and everyone can dribble. Um, you're but also he's doing a good job of that. City like, switching the ball. He's got a slide. He's doing an okay job of that. He did give like, away a penalty. Ooh, I like that. I really like that. Well, I mean, after the last time where he had like, what was it, like six to eight fouls or something like that um, and got a yellow card, this time only one foul, but it was like arm barring Emmerich Laporte in the penalty area, not from open play. So it wasn't one of those things where he got slippery in that case. It was like from a corner kick and across back post. He just sort of got the arm up and I saw, I tweeted the, the gif of it. It was, it was like experience versus an experience because Staminich didn't do a lot. 
he had the arm around the guy, but everyone's grabbing everybody and, and corner kicks. Like you always, the difference is that Laporte fought through it and Staminich was just a little bit too, uh, um, you know, when the guy starts pushing through, just kind of leave him because he's not going to win the ball. He's obviously focused on getting through the tackle. He wants you to hold on so that he can fall over and drag you down with him and win the penalty. And that's what happened. And just one of those ones where it's like, welcome to the big time fella. Like everybody here, not only is as good or better than you with their touch and their anticipation and whatever. It's also these guys are thinking three steps ahead because they've done this so many times. Like this is your first big game of this level. Laporte's played a hundred games of this level, probably more. And he knows how to turn that opportunity into a penalty. So that was, I, I saw a lot of that from Staminich. I think the first half, especially his passing was a little bit frantic. Like he didn't have a lot of opportunities to pass the ball, but when that's the case, you really just need to be accurate. And he I think like seven completed passes out of 15 or eight out of 15, I think it was, in the first half. Did second half. I haven't seen the final stats because um, UEFA hasn't updated them yet at the time of recording. But like a lot of these kind of things, it felt like, because also this was a big occasion for him in his career as a, as a, as a game, like as a milestone game. It was also a big occasion on an emotional level because his dad is a Manchester City fan, apparently. I found that out this week. He mentioned that in, a, in an interview thing. Um, his family also flew over. Like his, his mom, his dad, I think his sister as well was there in the crowd. It was the first time they've seen him play professionally because he signed for Copenhagen amidst the pandemic. Like There wasn't an opportunity to do this before. And this is the time that they've settled on, which is perfect because if your dad, <laughs> like Marco Staminich's dad being a Man City fan, and then the first game he gets to watch is his son playing against Man City in Manchester. Um, not so great with the weather. It looked a lot like uh, Bangladesh versus Pakistan in cricket that uh, in Christchurch, that kind of weather. But, I mean, what an occasion. I think it was also probably because of that, though, quite an emotional one for Staminich. So I think there were cases where you saw, like, maybe not deer in the headlights, but it just a bit too self-aware um, of what occasion. he's doing. But, you know, that's this how you go. You get through those ones early in your career and you're better the next time for it. It's, that's how, that's the thing about experience versus inexperience is that how do you get experience? By, by being inexperienced. Like, you have to start there, work through it, figure out these things. It's a, it's a big milestone for him. And I don't think it was his best performance, but I don't think you could say that about anybody in that Copenhagen team because they lost 5-0 and it probably could have been a lot more if you know City subbed off Haaland at half time. <laughs> he could have scored five himself if they kept going. It's it's one of those ones. Um who top money, they but also in the pool play. Who else like who's big learning up curve. Easier game. Um, well this is the halfway stage. They've now played every team once and they play every team once again and the opposite of whether it was home or away. So next week, guess what? Manchester City again. <laughs> do that one again but in Copenhagen this time so it might be a good opportunity for the family to actually stay over you know if you stay fly to Copenhagen afterwards see him play on the weekend in the league game and then see him play City on on Wednesday um that, also, that'd be cool <laughs> a good measuring stick you know previous week against Man City next week against Man City how does he perform any improvements yeah. you can also gauge his performance but we'll definitely be more intrigued when he plays a uh when he can dominate one of the uh weaker teams in his pool well, the they teams. are the weaker team in their pool is the problem. Um, Sevilla is the team he played last time, Champions League debut. Yeah, and in the first game, he was an unused sub against uh, Borussia Dortmund. Also shit. Copenhagen for life. Wow. Marcus Damanich, big man thing. He's going to dominate the next few games. Football Ferns wildcard. They are also in action coming up. They are playing Japan in Japan. And I saw there was a, uh, they might be playing in the snow in Christchurch in a couple of weeks as yeah. well. Um, that'll be fun for them. But they're playing against Japan. This is another... They're playing a lot of friendlies ahead of the World Cup, which is good to see. Japan also feels like one of these... Like I, I think the football fans have found a little groove where they've got suitable opponents. You know, where for a while we are talking about them um, playing USA, Canada, Sweden, and it was a bit tricky. What's the details for this game? When's it being played? And how are you feeling? Like, what's just the main vibe there with the football ferns against Japan? Yeah, 6.55 p.m. on Sunday evening over in Japan. Um, Japan used to be one of those teams. Like, they've made World Cup finals. They might have even won one before, um, come to think of it. Sort of, you know, 10, 15 years ago. The subsequent 
couple generations for Japan, not not just like just not quite as good as that was. So they're not one of those like very best team in the world calibers anymore. They're probably still the best team in Asia though. So it's 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 not an easy game. Um, it's certainly one they'll be, especially in Japan, will be expected to lose and maybe will lose. Like this is this is the kind of opposition where they've they've got an opportunity if they play to their potential kind of thing. I don't think the difference is insurmountable the way it is if they play, you know, USA or whoever. Um, but I, realistically, they're probably going to lose. If they, if they do, I mean, I think they've bought themselves some wiggle room with the two wins last round, again, last, uh, last window against Philippines and Mexico. When you get those wins in the bag, you you suddenly they're on a winning streak. Um, it doesn't matter so much if you drop one to Japan in a in a difficult situation where it's like, as long as they continue to make progress, we continue to see ways in which they're trying to score goals, um, combinations forming, all these kind of things. That's all right. Like I don't think we have to worry too much about the result here because they've got that sort of monkey off the back of just like however many games they've gone without scoring enough goals or winning enough games or whatever. Two wins in a row sets them up nicely they are as you say they're playing south korea i think in november after this so that's the i think it's november um the subsequent window i would imagine that's cool because they beat south korea not that long ago it was an upset win uh but also it was in south korea so they're coming to our turf this time that is also a little bit more beneficial and maybe they can get a win there as well who knows all but it's all part of the same progression of just trying to get in the best state possible for the world cup and there's some momentum after the last window you know they're getting two wins on the on the trot that gives you a little bit of a, a running start into this series and the one coming up and the fact is they are as you say playing a lot of games like filling out the calendar it's just it's it's what you want to see from them leading up to a home world cup this is it's how it's supposed to be and continue on the journey basically is it the same squad from those Philippine Mexico games? It's probably slightly stronger. It's mostly the same team. Um, a lot of the injuries and unavailabilities are still the case. You're not going to see Rhea Percival, obviously. Anneli Longo got injured in that tour. Um, Abby Ersteg is Trent Bolt, so she doesn't play friendly games, kind of thing, uh, which I wish they would. First of all, I wish they'd just be clear about it and just say, like, there's always she's focusing on club commitments right now blah 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 but don't really want to talk about it doesn't even get a mention in the in the squad announcement what you got to do is just say she's just make that Trent Bolt comparison kind of thing because you can hide behind the black caps <laughs> it's there's a precedent now so you can just say this is how it goes um it, which is fine as far as I'm concerned as long as Trent Bolt and Abby Ersic both play the major tournaments and the biggest games which both of them seem to still want to do so no dramas um but you know, Hannah Wilkinson didn't play those previous games because she was she got COVID on the tour. I think Malia Steinmans was another one, and Grace Jale was another one. So they will have a little bit more. Uh, Katie, uh, Katie Bowen is back available as well this time. She missed the last tour, but she's back for this one. And a few other players have just had good times at club level in between. And it is early season, so some of them were a little short on match fitness. That is increasingly getting better as games go on. So I think they are in a better place but they're also playing a much better team um which is the trick but the, you know the, the, as you say the, the just the the bottom line is I, I think this is a slightly stronger unit than we saw get wins last time and that's a good place for the ferns to be i'm going to give you very generously i'm going to give you a minute of national league whatever the fuck you want to do three two one go um I don't know what I want to do with it in the National League minute. Um, well, let's the, uh, let me check the fixtures. What have we got this weekend? So, for some reason, eight miles rushing through my head like knees, weak arms, oh, sweaty, bottom miles, spaghetti. <laughs> you got to step up and drop a National a League good, freestyle here. I'll restart the clock. Though. I'll restart the clock in uh, five, four, three, two, or one. Righto, Saturday in the men's combo, Christchurch United against Napier City Rovers. Christchurch United lost their first game. Napier City had a nice you know, sort of battling win over the Phoenix. I think that's actually quite a good game because those are two teams who I don't think are going to challenge for a title, but um, should give a good gauge of where they're both at. 
Um, particularly Christchurch United at home, one in the bounce back. Miramar versus Birkenhead will be a it's, a, it's an interesting one because Birkenhead won. Birkenhead beat Christchurch United, but I think Birkenhead are very good. So this was also like, if Miramar don't have Hamish Watson again, they might have some troubles there despite being at home. But if they do have Hamish Watson, you can beat any team on their day. Auckland City versus Kashmir Tech will be a great game because Kashmir Tech had a big one over Miramar last time in Auckland City or Auckland City. Sunday, you got Phoenix Reserve against Auckland United. Just straight up some of the best young players on in the country on both teams there to watch out for. And then Melville at home against Wellington Olympic. Olympic almost beat City last week. So they're a good team. They'll they'll have designs on winning the whole thing. Melville in Waikato is going to be a lot of fun. There should be a good atmosphere from that because I think you'll get a I think you'll get a decent home crowd there. Even if it's not big in numbers, it'll be loud and uh and sort of disabled. Women's comp, you got three games on Saturday, Northern Rovers against Eastern Suburbs be an absolute fizzer like this is game of the round across all of these things rovers have seven points from three games suburbs have won all three games scoring like 16 goals um rovers just won nine nil <laughs> they actually both these teams have played uh central in the last two weeks eastern suburbs beat the mate nil and then rovers beat the nine nil so goals galore between these two that'll be a great game springs against capital expect springs to probably roll them um, Southern against Central. Southern won last week against Capital. They'll they'll have a pretty decent chance here of a um, gone back to back with victories. Although Central probably will feel a little bit relieved after shipping seventeen goals <laughs> to this bro- to Rovers and Eastern Suburbs. Be pretty relieved to not be playing an Auckland team this week. And then on Sunday you got Auckland United, Canterbury Pride. Canterbury Pride lost to Springs two weeks ago. Lost to Suburbs last week. It's the third game in a row against an Auckland team. They are the one federation team you think are probably like in contention to to be able to challenge the Auckland teams. They lose three in a row. I don't think they're going to come back and make the final. So big game from them. And Auckland United maybe just a little bit vulnerable at the moment because a couple of players are at the under-17 World Cup who they had actually relied on quite a bit. Um, four players, actually. So maybe this is the, a good opportunity for the Pride to get a win on the road. Um, I think that was probably more than a minute, but there you go. There's a quick fire preview of all all nine games coming up. Two and a half minutes, but I like it. But but I covered both leagues, so we can half it. Yep, that's fair enough. Where's that, um, the Wellington Phoenix Auckland game? Is that in Wellington? That is in Wellington, and it is a... Um, which Auckland team was it? It was Auckland United, wasn't it? That is a precursor to the Wellington Phoenix's game, the senior A-League like A-League opener on Sunday. So I I would assume they'll both be on TV. Um, which I don't actually like. I'm not a big fan of like on the one hand, when the games are on Sky in the National League, you get better coverage, um, better quality sort of thing. You get probably more viewership and all that and more exposure. That's cool. On the other hand, really hard for me to get screenshots and gifs and, and video clips and stuff like that which is really annoying for writing about it and even just to watch replays is way more difficult than the youtube games but um yeah that is a that is a wellington phoenix double header on sunday so if you are going to the game get there early and watch both of them wellington phoenix are playing against adelaide united on the sunday wildcard and we also have the uh aotearoa breakers they have started their a-league season so we've got a brita a brita break mix a bit of break mix in our lives which is good to see breakers were decent in their first game um i, I like the uh good to see uh Liafa getting some game time like what he yeah, does absolutely. and the uh the other guard mcdowell white he's pretty good um there was one of the american imports it might have been the guy with the long hair he's not very good um <laughs> every time he touched the ball he he turned it over um but i still still learning there with the the breakers obviously you laid out some wellington phoenix hype and optimism in the variety show which was good as far as viewing them together, the Breakers, they seem a bit behind the uh, the Phoenix. I think the Breakers and Warriors are a few notches below where the Phoenix are right now. Was there enough from that first up game wildcard to get you a bit of excited about the Breakers? Because it's been a tough few years, but as we've talked a lot, a lot about returning to Aotearoa is, is immense for these teams. And I, I was like, 
I saw something recently where the Toronto Raptors were judged to have the best home fans or the best home advantage. And what do you know? The season where they were based in Tampa Bay, they weren't very good. And it's the same with the Warriors, Breakers and Phoenix. Like there was no home advantage for any of their mahi previously, as we've talked about um, ad nausea. So the Breakers revert to normal. Phoenix are back to normal. Happy days. Breakers were solid in their first up game. Were there any signs of life there that got you intrigued? Depends what you mean by intrigued. Like, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm definitely not fizzing out over the Breakers losing another game. I thought maybe that was an opportunity, just the way that game played out. Um, you know, Shea Lee, Shea Lee didn't play for Melbourne. Suddenly made a big difference. Um, also disappointing just from watching it. I, I like watching Shea Lee play. He's the most enjoyable um, Kiwi basketballer in that league and the best as well. Um, but they were competitive against a good team. So I, I do think that's positive. They also lost, and they had plenty of games last year, especially at the start of the season before everything just got depressing, where it was like they were comp they were competitive and they lost. So I, in a way, I'm not sure that much has changed. Um, but I do get better vibes about them with Modi Mayor as coach rather than Dan Shamir. I think Dan Shamir was not a wartime general. Um, he was not... He's not a rock out merchant the way that uh, Modi Mayor is. And then maybe this team, when they're in a, they've been in a bit of a, I don't know, a down buzz for the last couple of years, you kind of need that big personality of a coach to, to bring it out of you. Um, so I do get, and just, I think their recruitment and those kind of ideals was just better this year than it has been. Uh, except for that Brantley guy, as you mentioned, I, I think it's Brantley who, who you were saying. Um Three turnovers and five personal fouls in, in uh, 23 minutes. So he missed both his three-point attempts. Um, eh, six points, five rebounds, two assists is okay. I think he's actually there as a, um injury replacement, though, I think. Um, not sure. I, I, can't, I can't remember. The, the other two imports look decent, though. And they did definitely lead the way. Like They, they were relying a lot on those two guys down the stretch. Oh, uh, to, pardon. Um, Pardon and and Pardon Brown me. Jr. as well, yeah. <laughs> um, they were yeah they were solid. They played big minutes. They were the key guys. Um, that's pretty handy. I will note that the uh, the French Nick Star fella that they had uh, Ryan Rupert played a shade under twelve minutes and was a minus fifteen on his plus minus. So notice just well, normal um, Nick Star areas for the breakers. Yeah, let's keep track of this. The who who were the guys from last season? Returning players, I don't even no, know. No, who are the um, who are the next stars from last season? Oh, the next star last year. Um, oh, Besson. Yeah, Hugo Besson and um, and Usman Dieng. What are they up to? One of them is playing for the well, Dieng's playing for the Oklahoma City Thunder now. So because it's the Thunder and they're tanking as they always do. Um, so that's not so Mr. That's Wim not Banyama. Glowing, that's not a glowing endorsement if you're if you have made the team. Well, where everyone can make the team. Hugo Besson, what's he up to? Yeah, yeah. the, the Dieng will get good minutes and will get some nice stats, but for a team that's going to lose a lot. So it's not the best judgment of what he's up to. Dieng, um, Besson is a weird one because he got drafted really late on, like right, like one of the last couple picks, might have even been the last pick, by the Milwaukee Bucks. But they didn't actually want him this year. He was like a draft and stash. We'll see what he's like in a couple of years. And if he's good, we've got his rights, we'll bring him back over. Which I don't know how that works with the breakers because he didn't sign an nba contract because of that they just have his rights he hasn't signed a contract um but i'm not sure which club he ended up with but last day at one point he was highly likely to sign with the team that just released yanni wetzel so um straight so well, you... it's probably it probably not a coincidence but he is playing euro ball at the moment um, i think is what's going on with him so at the moment let's say the next uh thing is like a 2.5 out of 5 2.5 out of 10 <laughs> Ooh, 10 depends what you, i mean it just depends that's... what your priorities are because these guys are gonna dn got drafted nice and high um yeah but just keep it general like we're having a bit of fun here who cares like they aren't dominant forces they're not monsters they're not celebrated to be the big donnies as they are when the breakers sign yeah. them come through the breakers most of them go into oblivion, never to be seen again. Well, that that's the thing. They don't. Like, a lot of them go to... Well, so 
one or two of them might have, but the guys have gone through the breakers, got drafted night. Like even Hampton, he's bounced around a couple of teams, but he's he's playing NBA games. He's he's still in a good position. Um, it's just that the he's time not one of the best the, players the in window, the NBA. No, of course not. But the window there at the breakers is like if that's your focus, it's bad because none of them help them win. They all turn up and then they play yeah. badly because they're 18, 19 years old. The breakers might get a financial boost if a guy gets drafted high. Like there's probably some compensation coming back their way, which is nice business. But it's not, it's also not a coincidence. These guys that like this era of the breakers focusing on these next stars has coincided with them being fucking terrible. Like I'm just losing heaps of games. It's obviously not the only reason. There are several reasons, but they have not helped them win in any way. So if you're just looking at like where do those guys end up after going for the breakers, a lot of them end up in pretty good places. Would they have gone there anyway if they hadn't gone to the breakers? I think probably. In fact, I would suggest maybe some of them might have gone drafted a little bit higher if they'd gone to college or played G League or whatever, or even just stayed in Europe in one or two cases. Alloped them into being better than they would have otherwise. So from the player's perspective, 2.5 out of 5 sounds fair. From the breakers' perspective, these guys come here, don't do anything, make the team slightly worse worse and then go on and it looks cool when they get drafted and you get to tweet about them heaps but they make the team worse for the time that they're there so i'm still saying 2.5 out of 10 from the breakers perspective but they love the marketing side of it so for them it's a major success if you care about winning basketball games it's the opposite wellington phoenix wild card what is one thing to watch out for with the wellington phoenix in their first game of the a-league season against adelaide united I think, well, there's a lot of stability at the back, which is nice. There's, uh, I think Yugakovic will probably start in the midfield, which should, uh, alongside Clayton, oh no, Clayton Lewis is injured, isn't he? Um, that's not ideal, uh, but they should still have a, a decent enough midfield that they can rely upon. Um, it's up front where it gets interesting. Because there's been a lot of changeover. David Ball is still injured, so he won't be there. Um, ben Wayne is competing for a spot and did well in the FFA, FFA Cup game. So he's a chance, especially if Atelier wants to ease in some of his uh, foreign imports. But there are three new players in those attacking spots with on import visas. Um, Jan Sass, the Brazilian sort of winger, likes to cut in and shoot a lot. Um, Bozidar Krajev who's a Bulgarian playmaker, nice and looks like quite an unselfish player. He's a bit sort of like lanky and awkward, but he's he's got good touch and is looking for a looking for a good pass. I think he'd more likely to play on the left. Um, and I uh, can't remember his name, but the Polish fella up front as well. So uh, Zorowski, Zorow, Zervada, Zervada, something like that. Oscar Zervada. Um, I probably got that wrong. I haven't looked at the theme team. I haven't looked at the. I haven't had long enough to get to know him yet. So, um, but he's sort of like the the aerial threat target man up front. And you've got Costa Barbarusas has signed up front as well. Who I think, from what I saw from him in those FFA Cup games, and just like the player he is these days, I think is maybe low key the best of all those signings. Especially because he is a Kiwi player. Like he's not going against your import thing. So been able to sign all these other guys but a lot of new players to, to integrate into those attacking areas. And a lot of them are either either more experienced in the case of, um, of Costa or even in those, um, you know, the, the imports that they've signed are sort of like, they're not 32, 33-year-old veterans. They're 24, 25, 26-year-old sort of coming into the best part of their career things. They are guys who are leaving, you know, European excursions or whatever to move to Australia. So maybe it's a they're at a phase a certain phase in their career but they're guys who have played in big games and know what they're doing replacing say up and karmas like reno piscopo who always looked good didn't score anywhere near enough goals or assists or or whatever um or gary hooper who was you know fully experienced but always injured so what are you going to do if a guy's not available um that's that's a lot of work for Talai to do in terms of integrating all these new attackers but also i it's been a clear focus. So you gotta you, you gotta sit back and see like, well, how does it look? And it's not gonna be something that clicks from week one. It will take time. It always does take time, but they've had a decent preseason together and he, he's been fairly cautious. I do wonder if we will see Ben Wayne getting that start just to, 
to sort of ease them in, as I say, but that's definitely the focus because it has been a problem of the Phoenixes, like when they've lost playoff games in the last few years, not being able to convert their chances and just not having that attack and uh, impetus when it mattered the most. And that's 100% what the offseason has focused on. You see, like three import signings all in those attacking spots. That's without a doubt what they're going for. Um, four, if you include David Ball, who's also on an import contract. Like four of their things are in the front four. Like they put, they could name their two, two tens and their two nines all imports. Um, you'd have to drop Costa to do that, which I don't think they'd do, but still. And that also means like you're going to have 60 minutes gone in a game you're one nil down. It's not clicking. You're going to have someone extremely good on the bench that you can throw on. You don't have to turn to an academy play. We're not going to Oscar Van Haddam. Um, This is not fair on you, Oscar, but we expect you to go on now and do something amazing and win us this game or Ben Old or whoever. We're turning to like guys who some of them have played international football, you know, um, Costa Barbarousas or whoever, like 50 cap all way. Those are the kind of players they're looking for. And that was 100% a priority of Tellies in the offseason. So now we see how that goes. Like, this is what you targeted. Well, how does it work? That's that's the focus. If my antenna is correct, you don't have high hopes for the Breakers this season. So I won't ask you who will finish higher, the Phoenix or the Breakers, because obviously I think we're both in agreement that yeah, the Phoenix answer. will finish higher than the Breakers. Where do you predict the Wellington Phoenix to finish on the A-League ladder? I, I think with the boost of home field advantage, I think they could go as high as third, which would equal their best ever thing. I, that's, that's my, I'm not, not locking it in, but that's my pick, my optimistic Beauty. pick. Happy days. Top six for sure, though. Uh, do you want to take your prediction further? Top eight? Well, no, I do, the top, top six three. because that means, top six means you get a finals game. That's the point. I'm saying they will absolutely be playing some postseason footy. Um, Next season. Hopefully a home game. If you finish third year, I think you get a home game. So there you go. Next season, I believe the Warriors will finish top 13. Well, they finish top 13 every season, don't they? Yeah, no shit. That's Consistency. Why That's why it's funny. All righty. Happy days. That is the niche cast. They don't finish 16th. Big it up to yourself. Big up Baltero Sport. And uh, big up Papatua Nuku and uh, Ranganui for delivering yeah. us uh, yeah. beautiful weather. Big Kia week kaha, for them. Stay beautiful. Mouldy order. Raise your mana. Cha-cha.